Would you believe it if I told you that there was a city in Chile with a metro that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the world's best? A system which features automated trains, platform screen doors, express service, and integrated ticketing with modern regional rail? A system not dissimilar in size to the Chicago L, but with over three times as many daily users, and plans to add three more lines and plentiful extensions in just the next decade at bargain basement prices. Well, this system is real, and it's the Santiago Metro, and like a lot of metro systems in Latin America, it is absolutely awesome. Before we ride around the impressive metro system, let's get acquainted with Santiago, which is by far the largest city in Chile, and which has a significant portion of the country's overall population in its metropolitan area. As always, if you want an explainer on your city, leave a comment and mention what makes it special down below. This is Central Station or Alameda, which really isn't all that central these days given the city's development is generally near the Mapocho River, which travels east-west across the north of the city, though dense development also extends out to the south and east. Development would likely extend even further, but it runs into mountains surrounding the city to the north and east. Santiago's International Airport is roughly 15 kilometers northwest of the city center, although it's currently not connected to the rail network, despite only being a few kilometers away from it. In the city center, there are a number of great public spaces with metro access, including Plaza de Armas, which reminds me of a certain station on Montreal's metro, and the Palacio de la Moneda, the office of the Chilean president and its surrounding grounds. Further afield, we also have the National Stadium, where major events and concerts are held, as well as O'Higgins Park, a giant mixed-use park with an amusement park within it, as well as the major Movistar Arena, and wide open spaces, different gardens, and additional event and sports venues. There's also a park at the center of Santiago known as Metropolitan Park, which encompasses some of the hills near the central business district of the city. Now, to get around Santiago, we have the Metro, which first opened in just 1975 and has grown into a roughly 140km network with 136 stations, though as we'll see later, the system is growing rapidly. Early plans for Santiago's Metro were drawn up by the French, and the influence is obvious from numbered lines to yes, the rubber-tired trains, which is one of the most significant oddities in Santiago's Metro. Like in Montreal and Lausanne, these trains were derived from the technology created for the Paris Metro, and like these systems, Santiago also adopted a similar naming convention, with letters denoting the type of rolling stock, be it rubber tire or steel wheels, before numbers representing the year. As with some other metros planned from a grand master plan, Santiago built its lines out of order, respecting their initial designations in the plans, which were actually quite well respected over the decades. To elaborate on the specifics of Santiago's rubber tire trains that run on lines 1, 2, and 5, most models were manufactured by either CAF or Alstom. However, the NS88 model, developed by Conquerill of Mexico, who was later acquired by Bombardier and thus part of Alstom, are actually really similar to the steel wheeled trains running on Mexico City's Suburban Line A. I'll be doing an updated explainer of Mexico City soon, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. Now, the NS88 isn't the only particularly interesting model of rubber-tired train in Santiago, as the NS93 is clearly a derivative of the iconic MP89 trains from Paris. That being said, some NS93 sets from the beginning have been 8 cars long. So where do these trains actually run? Let's take a look at lines 1, 2, and 5. Line 1 is the most heavily used line on the entire Santiago Metro, and with a daily ridership in excess of 700,000 riders pre-COVID, it's one of the most used single metro lines in the Americas. Thanks to its modern communications-based train control, or CBTC signaling, trains come as frequently as every two minutes in peak periods. Line 1 is 19 kilometers long with 27 stations and broadly runs northeast to southwest through the city on a mostly underground alignment, with two short trench sections in the west, passing through the densest neighborhoods and running near many important sites, such as the Palacio de la Moneda as well as a major university and central station. The line runs quite close to the Mapacho River, especially in the center of the city, providing connections to the Metropolitan Park just a short walk away. Line 2 is a similar length to Line 1 at 21 kilometers with 22 stations, traveling from north to south through the city and diverting to the west to pass the traditional central business district. While the northern portion of Line 2 is entirely tunneled, after crossing the river, Line 2 diverts to run in the median of an expressway hemming in the CBD to the west, ducking under a freeway deck to connect with Line 1. This style of alignment continues past O'Higgins Park, which Line 2 provides connections to, before the line dives back underground and diverts back east running to the far south of the city in tunnels. Line 5 is the last of the rubber-tired lines, albeit the longest, with 30 stations over 30 kilometers of track. 
the line forms an east-west arc opening south, and beginning underground in the west, the line pops above and below ground, connecting to line 1 at its western terminus before continuing east in tunnels to cross Keen to Normal Park, where a station box was created during metro construction to enable a future regional rail station underground here. Let's take a moment to address those regional trains. Currently Santiago has a single frequent suburban rail line which travels to the city of Nos to the south and uses modern high capacity European style multiple unit trains, operating on 1676mm track and 3000 volt DC overhead wire. This service is quite high quality and was branded as Metrotran originally, and it'll also be augmented by another service headed to the southwest which should be completed in the coming years. This project will also include the beginning of a tunnel north under Central Station. At the same time, another suburban rail service is being implemented from Santiago to the north, which will feature a tunnel segment into the city center to connect with the metro at the aforementioned Quinta Normal station. Eventually, it seems likely these suburban rail services will connect up and run through the center of Santiago, forming the basis of what could be a comprehensive European-style regional rail network with a center city tunnel. From Quinta Normal, the line continues east, intersecting Line 2 at one of its freeway median stations before crossing the CBD and turning south to cross Line 1 a second time. As Line 5 leaves the CBD to the south, it once again rises to travel on an elevated guideway past one of Santiago's major universities before dipping back below ground adjacent to two major shopping centers to terminate. Because so much of Line 5 is elevated, and because rubber tire trains are actually often louder than steel wheeled trains, I made a video on this previously, sound barriers have actually been implemented on one section of Line 5, which sort of reminds me of Hong Kong. Unsurprisingly, not all of Santiago's metro lines use Paris-derived rubber tire technology. This other trend began in 2005 with Line 4, which is a 25km, 23 station metro line that uses more conventional 3 meter wide steel wheeled metro trains that get their power from 3rd rail. Line 4 runs north-south through eastern Santiago, starting at Line 1 in the north, heading underground before popping above ground and running above the surface before connecting with Line 5 at its eastern terminus, about halfway along its route, and continuing further south with much of the route elevated above ground. What's really interesting about Line 4 is that alongside Lines 2 and 5, it actually has express services during rush hour, a feature which really isn't that common on metro systems. Rather than being implemented with quad track or passing tracks at select stations, this is implemented as a skip stop service. So different stations get different color codes, with major stations getting both color codes, and services along the lines are branded either one color or the other. This means passengers may need to wait slightly longer for a train, but will only stop at stations of the same color code. If you're wondering why this service isn't implemented on Line 1, it likely has to do with restrictions on capacity, since a skip stop service is naturally going to limit the capacity at any station where all trains do not stop. What I find fascinating is there's also an 8km 6 station Line 4A, which reminds me a lot of the BIS lines in Paris. Line 4A was completely designed, as per the track design, to operate as a branch of Line 4, but likely due to its entirely highway median alignment, demand is substantially lower on Line 4A than on the southern section of Line 4. Because of this, Line 4A runs shorter 3-car trains as opposed to the 6-car trains of Line 4, which is practical as the trains come in 3-car walkthrough sets. At the eastern terminus of Line 4A, one of the tracks has been covered over to enable Spanish solution boarding on the trains and at its western terminus, the line connects to the southern terminus of Line 2. Recently in 2017 and 2019, Santiago opened two new metro lines, which are actually among the most modern in the world, the 15km 10 station Line 6 and the 22km 18 station Line 3. Line 3 is an entirely underground line, which forms an arc opening northeast, running from the city's north south across the CBD to connect to Lines 2 and 5 at Plaza de Armas and Line 1 at one of the major universities, before turning east and intersecting again with Line 5 and then with Line 4 before terminating. Line 6 is more of a circumferential arc that opens to the northwest and runs from a terminus at the north on Line 1 south to intersect with Line 3 before turning west to pass the National Stadium and then connect with Lines 5 and 2, before crossing and connecting with the suburban rail and terminating to its west. Like Line 3, Line 6 is 100% underground. So what actually makes these lines so modern? Well, both operate large 5 car long steel wheeled fully automated trains manufactured by CAF, with large windowed doors that look incredibly slick. These trains are powered by overhead lines at 750 volts DC and were some of the first high capacity automated metro lines in the Americas. 
In addition to the modern trains, stations also feature universal platform screen doors, which still aren't used on some major transit systems globally, like New York and Berlin, for safety and comfort. And these go a step further with train loading indicators, letting you know how busy each carriage is before the train arrives, and so that you can reposition yourself to get into a less busy car. It's fascinating to me that the most modern rail transit system in the Americas isn't in a place like Silicon Valley, but instead in Santiago. Now, of course, Santiago isn't just impressive because it's built up an incredible network over the years, but because it's actually planning and building so much more. And, as has been highlighted, despite Santiago moving towards tunneling, virtually all of their metro cost control has been highly effective, and new metro projects are built for a fraction of the price that's seen in the UK, or North America, or Australia and New Zealand, despite being more modern in many ways. Santiago is leveraging this incredible expertise in building metro to build a whole lot of metro. To start, existing lines are being expanded. Line 2 is already being extended south some distance to extend similarly far to Line 4. Line 3 will be extended northwest to connect directly with the northern suburban rail, while Line 6 will also be extended to the southwest suburban rail, better integrating the metro and suburban rail systems outside of the city center. It will also be extended one stop to the northeast. On top of these extensions, three entirely new lines will be constructed. These lines will be automated as with Lines 3 and 6, and likely entirely underground. Line 7 will be a new northern-east-west line which will parallel Line 1 closely in the east, but provide fewer stops to create an express service akin to Line 14 in Paris. Line 7 will provide connections to Line 6, twice to Line 1, Line 5, Line 2, and Line 3, and the Northern Suburban Rail. And the rolling stock for this line will be from Alstom, similar to what's being used on the REM, Sydney Metro, and more. The line is already under construction, and discussions are underway on how it could potentially connect to the airport in the future. The new Line 8 will start from the interchange of Line 1 and 6 in the north, and will travel north-south paralleling Line 4 and parts of Line 6, connecting with Line 3 on the way and crossing over Line 4 to operate on its east partway along. Another north-south line will be added in Line 9, which will start from Line 1 in the north and continue far south connecting with Lines 3, 6, and 4A. This will leave Santiago with a shockingly extensive metro network that would be one of the world's largest if it were completed today, with nine metro lines, three suburban rail lines, and several interchange stations with three or more lines connected. This will likely eliminate thousands upon thousands of car and bus trips and massively reduce emissions. And all I can think is, when can I get back to Santiago to visit? Thanks for watching. Thanks to Theo and Ismail for providing on-the-ground footage for this video.